close. I guess before I begin, uh, I want to thank Brother Norbert first for his very kind introduction. Then I want to make two pre notes that are not part of the talk. First of all, um, you will have noticed that the title is slightly different. The original title of the identity in the 21st century, which is certainly an ambitious sounding topic, was given to me by the, um, by the organizing committee, but I realized that that might have been a bit too ambitious, so I am using a much more modest topic, more, much more modest title. The second thing is, I, from here, I, I see you've been listening for a whole uh, morning already, and right before coming up, the president of Arupa in Denver said that I should tell jokes. <laughs> so I thought I'd try to do that just to begin, because you're not going to get too many jokes from this. <laughs> just to make Father Tim happy. <laughs> and also to, uh, as a uh, defense for myself as I begin, because as as you heard from Father Norbert, I really have hardly any experience in secondary education. I have often wondered why I said yes to this in the first place. <laughs> but there's a story about a speaker who was terribly boring, was a horrible speaker, and as he was going on giving his speech, his audience bit by bit drifted away. So finally, he was left with a single member of his audience. So he ended with one old man in the front row. So at the end of his talk, with great, you know, uh, you know, with much gratitude, but also a lot of, uh, with sincere feeling of apology, he went up to the man and he asked forgiveness. He said, I'm really sorry. Thank you so much for staying till the end. I know I'm a horrible speaker. I'm very boring, but thank you so much for staying. And the old man looked at him and said, don't worry, I don't blame you. I blame the ones who invited you. <laughs> I feel so much better having said that. Because now I feel absolved of responsibility and you can look at Jose Mesa and Dan Carmody. And I can do what I have to do. Fine. As you can see here, this is a picture of the Jesuits who were gathered at the recent Congregation of Procurators in Nairobi that just finished two weeks ago, and I'd like to share a little about that with you. But I'd like to begin um, with a story with concrete experience. A few years ago, I had the privilege of meeting some secret Jesuits in an Asian country which, due to the political sensitive, politically sensitive situation there, shall remain unnamed. It was an amazing experience. These Jesuits were all relatively young, in their 40s. They were known publicly to be the Austin priests, and all held key leadership positions in their diocese. No one in the diocese knew that they were Jesuits, except their bishop. And in fact, we had to meet in a restaurant some distance away from the city where they worked for their security and I suppose for mine as well. But that evening meeting with these secret Jesuits, I was deeply struck by this encounter with these admirable men. Three things struck me. First was the fact that although they could not publicly identify themselves as Jesuits, there was clearly something deeply Jesuit about them, and Jesuit at its best. They were among the res most respected priests in their diocese, known for their dedication and excellence in ministry and preaching. They were known to be spiritual men who lived simply, and therefore could be trusted with the formation of other priests and with their arts and finances. During a time of crisis, in fact, it was one of these hidden Jesuits 
who help the bishop arrive at a principled position vis-a-vis -vis the government authorities, and who rallied the Catholic community to remain strong despite threats and danger. Secondly, I found myself wondering why these men chose to remain Jesuit when there were no evident advantages to being members of the society. On the contrary, they had put themselves at risk in choosing to identify themselves, however secretly, as Jesuits. During the course of the dinner, I tried to ask them what led them to this path, why they chose to become Jesuits. And I was very struck that no one gave this complex calculation of benefits versus costs, which is probably something I would do. To a man, it all came down to feeling called by God. Third, when I asked them what the Society of Jesus could do for these secret Jesuits, their answer was very simple. They wanted two things, more formation and more experience of community life. I wanted to begin with these, reflection, these reflections with the memory of these men these brothers of ours, who at this very moment, without drama or fanfare, unknown to the world, <coughs> are in fact living heroic Jesuit lives. I think they remind us that Jesuit identity is not primarily about public labels, but about a spirit a way of living and serving in commitment, freedom, and courage. It's not an external brand, but a depth of response to an interior call from God. Those men challenged me to ask myself how deeply I value my own Jesuit identity, whether I regard it as something worth guarding and keeping, even without prestige or honor, or worse in the face of danger. The response of these men to remind me that this identity needs continued deepening in formation and the continued support of the community. And finally, on this feast of Saint Ignatius, these men help me gracefully remember that the spirit of Ignatius lives on today even amidst very difficult circumstances, and that it is a spirit that makes a difference for the good in this world. All of this is by way of context. Because our concern this morning is to reflect on how we too can sustain and deepen Ignat that Ignatian spirit in our schools in the light of our challenges and difficulties, as well as new possibilities and hopes. In fact, however, this is a theme about which, about which you know far more than I. The issue of the Jesuit identity of our schools, how to specify this identity, how to promote it, how to create formation programs, instruments of assessment, sponsorship reviews, all of this you have struggled with and have made significant, even dramatic progress in over recent years. I've heard it said, and I don't think it's inaccurate to say, that at no time in the past have our schools been so aware of, so insistent on, and so successful in promoting Jesuit and or Ignatian identity as today. Thus, my goal is very modest. I view my presentation this morning as an aid, a stimulus to reflection, if you will in preparation for the more important workshops this afternoon. I realize it must be very difficult. You've been listening all this time. I hope the workshops give you a chance to talk as well. Uh, but at any rate, I hope that what I will share will help you surface your own experiences, your own achievements, your own hopes, your own challenges in promoting Jesuit identity in the schools. And how do I want to do this? You will be pleased to know that I will not rehash documents that you already know about. So what I want to do is just focus on 10 
that sounds like a lot, but 10 issues that emerged, I believe, during the recent Congregation of Procurators in Nairobi. And I would like to raise 10 sets of questions connected with Jesuit identity and mission. Okay. Is that okay? That's the plan. You actually have no choice. That's, <laughs> that's, that's what's been planned, but I thought I'd ask anyway. First of all, what is a congregation of procurators? As you may or may not know, all other religious workers and congregations have regular chapters or international gatherings mandated by their law. The Society of Jesus alone does not, because Ignatius did not want to waste too much time on international meetings. <laughs> he felt they were a distraction from ministry. However, in the Constitutions, Ignatius stipulated that regularly persons were to come from the provinces to give the general information. And by the time of the third general, St. Francis Borgia, still in the 16th century, this stipulation became formalized, formalized as a congregation of procurators, a gathering of representatives from every province every three or four years to do precisely that, give Father General information on the state of the society. Procurators, it's a strange name, but procurators are elected from the provinces to allow a voice different from that of the provincial to share its perspective on how things are going on in the province. So each procurator visits the communities and the works of the province and reports directly to Father General. So in a way, it's kind of internal audit of the provinces. And I might suggest that all presidents and directors of schools here might want to introduce such a structure into their schools. When they come together in a congregation, the procurators have two related functions. First, to discuss under the leadership of Father General the state of the society and other universal concerns. And secondly, mostly but not exclusively based on that discussion, to discern whether a general congregation is called for or not. You will be relieved, probably not surprised to know that this congregation decided not to call a general congregation. In a sense though, what is most important, well, the vote itself is probably not what is most important about congregation. What are perhaps more important are the discussions on the state of the society. During this congregation, there were four moments, four key moments of reflection and discussion. First, the general delivered his Destatu Societatis Jesu, his State of the Society of Jesus Address, which is an important document. After listening to the general's address, the procurators broke into small groups to discuss the Destatu and to raise questions relating to what Father General said or what he failed to say. So about 90 questions came back from the procurators. Um, a group of us, two of us, synthesized and streamlined and put together the questions and brought them down to 42. And the next day, Father General responded to all 42. The second moment of reflection was a day given to reflecting on Jesuit mission today. As you know, Father General has created three new secretariats the service of faith, the promotion of justice, collaboration. And he wants that all these dimensions should be present in all our ministries. So we had a day of reflecting on these dimensions, looking at the lights and shadows of the society today in these areas, looking at um, positive things, and then eliciting recommendations. Third, there was a day on community admission a relatively new understanding of community life in the society. Jesuit community has been traditionally described as community for mission. But GC35 insisted that Jesuit community is not only for mission, it is itself mission. In other words, the way we Jesuits live together is not just a support to mission, 
but it is itself a way of fulfilling mission. So the procurators had one day reflecting on this new paradigm to see how it's been appropriated in society, to see best practices, challenges, and of course, to end up with recommendations. Finally, we had today in Africa and Madagascar. The 35th General Congregation affirmed that the society has five universal preferences, by which I mean five apostolic challenges that are so significant and so complex that no single province or region can respond to them adequately, but that these challenges require the dedication and combined resources of the entire society. And Africa is one of these five <coughs> universal preferences. The others are China, displaced people, the intellectual apostolate, and the Roman houses. So three Jesuits from Africa gave brief but excellent presentations, and one of them is here, Pablo Orobato, the, the provincial of East Africa, who will share something with you tomorrow. We spent a day learning about Africa, or more importantly, as Father Orobato said, unlearning all the biases and stereotypes that we had accumulated. And we reflected on the gifts and opportunities of Africa and Madagascar for the Universal Society and the Church. So that's just by way of background on the Congregation of Procurators. I thought it might be of some interest uh, to you. I might add that the decision of Father General to hold this congregation in Nairobi was historic. It was the first congregation of the society outside of Europe in almost 500 years. And the reason for this, of course, is that, as Father General pointed out, today 65% of Jesuits' information are from Africa and Asia. And the future of the society will be very different from the one we have now. And so Father General said, we are in Africa precisely to experience this change, to reflect on it, and to celebrate it. And celebrate it we did. See some pictures here. It was a lot of <laughs> dancing. This was just to bring out ice cream and cake. <laughs> and as you can see, the novices, the second year novices, provided us with music, which was wonderful, lively music, complete with all sorts of bulletins. And this last picture shows you Jesuits trying very hard. <laughs> To do a little dancing. <laughs> it's a little funny. If you, if you know Orlando Torres, you can see him waving his hands. And he looks uh, very serious. <laughs> but the point is, Father General summarized it wonderfully when he said that um, in the East, in Asia, there has been a focus on spiritualities of the way. In the West, there has been a passion for the truth. And in Africa, we discovered and experienced what is perhaps most important, life, joy, hope, energy. And if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, then we all need to network and to experience the richness of all the continents so that we might know the fullness, the totality of Christ. So that's my way of background, and now we go to the 10 issues. I know that sounds like a lot, but uh, it's very helpful to know that there are 10, because you know that by the time I reach number five, there are only five more left. <laughs> so it is from Father General's the statue of these discussions of the congregation, I draw the following points. I hasten to add that this is an entirely personal th synthesis and has nothing in, of an official nature about it. This may not even be the best synthesis. And I would like to call your attention to the fact that there are five people here who are procurators who experienced all of this, and they can supplement, correct, or uh, enrich what I said. So you have Johanna Siebner from Germany here. You have Chesda Chimhanda from Z Zimbabwe here, Memo Baranda from Chile is here, uh, Pati Alvarez, who was secretary of the congregation, 
uh, is here, and Stephen Chow from the Chinese province here. So if I say anything that you have doubts about, you can talk to them. <laughs> All right, let's begin. Like I said, I wanted to raise 10 points of reflection that emerged, I think, from the Congregation of Procurators. First thing. I think it's significant that in the section on Joseph Apostolates in his Destato Address, Father General ended by saying that one of the main challenges is Catholic, the Catholic and Jesuit identity of our house. He noted that the procurators in their reports say that much is being done to clarify and strengthen Catholic and Jesuit identity. Yet a large number of procurators still feel that more needs to be done, and Father General <coughs> indicated that he agrees with this judgment, particularly in the light of three factors the expansion of our institutions, the increasing secularization of our cultures, and the fact that our institutions are functioning in very competitive contexts. Competition, as you know, that is sometimes based on criteria that are not necessarily those that are most important or that should be most important for us. What is most interesting for me, though, is the way Father General framed the question of Catholic Virgins with identity. This is what he said. This is not an issue of control or power, but of how and whether our institutions continue to be primarily apostolic institutions, clear about their primary aim of serving the mission of the church and of society. The essential criterion, then, for judging whether an institution authentically lives out, lives out its Jesuit identity is that its primary and operative self-understanding is that it is, first of all, an apostolic instrument. And so for reflection, I, for each section, I will just raise questions for reflection. The first set of questions, then, might be the following. Do our schools understand themselves and function as primarily apostolic instruments? To what extent is the vision that a Jesuit school is not just an academic institution, but an instrument for the mission of God, operated and shared by governing boards, faculty members, staff, parents, and students? What are we doing to keep that absolute perspective? So, first one. Second one. I mentioned earlier that Father General had created three new secretaries, and you met three new secretaries yesterday. But actually, only two of the three secretaries are completely new. <coughs> since the Secretariat associated with issues of social justice has existed in the Curia since the 1980s. The Secretariat for the Service of Faith was established partly because there is a sense that we have presumed this dimension of mission too much in our institutions, and that the time has come to give it more explicit attention. So we all say that, we've, we've been doing it, but the question is, um, how much explicit attention do we give it? And during the congregation, it was interesting that some of the factors that make faith more difficult and threatened in our time were mentioned during the discussions. Aggressive secularism, a widespread indifference, fundamentalism, the popular perception that religions are connected to violence or intolerance, the loss of credibility of the church in many places. I thought it was very interesting. Some shared their impression that while we have been successful in our schools in promoting social concern and responsibility, the whole man for others and men and women for others thrust, where we have perhaps been less successful is bringing our students to faith. That is, in leading them to the joy of friendship with Jesus in his community, the church. This is 
an opinion, but it was raised for you to validate or to uh, disagree with. Someone suggested that what is going on in many of our institutions might be described as evangelization light. And that if this is not sufficient to meet the challenges of our time. Another person mentioned that in his assistancy, which I will not mention, there seems to be a very sharp distinction between sectors. The parishes take care of serving faith, the social centers take care of promoting justice, and the schools, well, they take care of education. Thus, a second set of questions. How are we doing in terms of serving faith? How do we assess our schools in terms of serving faith? How do we help those we serve to the joy and hope of friendship with Christ in the church? And in non-Christian contexts, uh, I come from Asia Pacific, where mo most of our countries are not Christian. The question that was raised a while ago is an important question. How do we serve faith in non-Christian contexts? The point is not to presume answers, but to face the question. And so one very interesting suggestion was to ask each institution to do an examine, a self-assessment in terms of service of the faith. I think that would be an interesting exercise, especially if it's done honestly. One could gather best practices, and at the same time, it might invite us to be more explicit about this primary element of our mission. Third point. Part of the service of faith is to lead people to know, love, and find their place in the church. In his Dissatu, Father General underlined the fact that Jesuit identity is, as the formula, formula of the Institute indicates, fundamentally linked to service of Christ and of the Church. But what I found most striking in Father General's speech was the way he formulated <coughs> the issue in terms of our mission of reconciliation. As you remember, as you recall, G335 specified the mission of the society today as one of reconciliation, of building bridges. And Father General Drawing on this, pointed out that all Jesuits and all Jesuit institutions should build and be bridges in the church, particularly in local churches where there is much polarization and division. So a third point of reflection for our schools. How are we bridging the gap between young people and the church? between our school community and the church. What are the, difficulties, the difficulties we are experiencing in this area, and how are we responding to them? As one procurator observed, if people develop a love for the society or the Jesuits, apart from a love from the church, for, for the church, one wonders whether we have been bridge builders or whether we have <coughs> intensified the barriers. Fourth point. The Secretariat for Collaboration is also new. And the reason why there is uh, a secretary dedicated to this is it was brought out by Father General in his dissatu. Basically, Father General pointed out that while there have been magnificent develops, developments in Jesuit lay partnership in some places, in the sharing of spirituality, mission, leadership. In other places, unfortunately, collaboration is not adequately understood. There is a lack of systematic and sustained formation programs for collaboration for Jesuits and lay partners, and there are not enough venues for shared planning and leadership. Those are the words of Father General. And he actually begins by saying that the primary difficulty is that some Jesuits find it very difficult to work with anyone, <laughs> whether lay or Jesuit. 
uh, I was talking the other evening with Sonia from Brazil, and she was pointing out that her many years of work with, with Jesuits, that is the issue. It's not, it's not whether you can work with lay people, or with, with, with people of other beliefs, or with Jesuits. It's whether you can work with anyone. And it's, it's one of these universals of society. Uh, several years ago, we were in Indonesia, and there were, to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the Jesuits in Indonesia, and Father General was there as a guest of honor, and there was a video of lay people and collaborators talking about the Jesuits. And it was really strange because there were people from different ministries and they were all going, oh, the judge is so wonderful, they're so spiritually profound, they're so bright, they're such trendsetters, they're cutting edge, but they work best by themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether we should be laughing about this. <laughs> During the discussions, there was an honest admission that a major obstacle to collaboration is a clericalism that exists precisely in the parts of the society where Jesuits are more numerous, in the parts of the society where Jesuits are growing. It's a major problem. In other words, in Africa and Asia. And it's a clericalism that's shared by both priests and laity. In some places, it's lay people who don't want other lay people to assume leadership. However, perhaps a subtler and more powerful block to collaboration also emerged, namely the false understanding that collaboration is not on the same level as the service of faith or the promotion of justice. Someone said, collaboration isn't really about mission. It's a strategy for mission. It's a means towards mission. And this instrumentalist view of collaboration basically suggests that we're in collaboration simply because we're adapting to our diminished numbers. Importantly, during the congregation, many procurators also affirmed that GC34 had, collab had already clarified that collaboration is not just a means, but really a good in itself the coming to life and practice of Vatican II's understanding of the Church. So a fourth point for, for reflection might be, in our schools, is collaboration viewed simply as a means, or is it valued as an integral part of mission? What are we doing to change attitudes like clericalism or an instrumentalist view of collaboration? Fifth, halfway through. Several times during the congregation, Father General is highlighting that in many and perhaps most places, the society does not run our institutions the way we used to. In the past, a school, for example, was entrusted to a Jesuit community, and that community provided leadership, governance, and ensured apostolicity, if you wish. Thus, an interesting point that emerged during the discussions was the need to think of a wider Ignatian apostolic community composed of Jesuits, other religious, lay people, people of other faiths, all sharing a depth of commitment to mission. This apostolic community, not a community in the sense of people living together, would be a group that sees the school primarily as apostolic instrument and would protect and promote this apostolic dimension. In fact, it was interesting. It was pointed out that the governing boards of our schools may not, in fact, be this apostolic community. In many cases, they're not which is something very significant. One indicator that the society should withdraw from sponsorship of an institution is if an apostolic community cannot be identified in an institution, or whether there is an apostolic community, but it is powerless, it has no influence in the school. 
So, question for reflection. What is the Ignatian Apostolic Community in your school? Who comprises it? How is it sustained? And how is it empowered to keep the school primarily apostolic in strength? Six. The notion of a broader Ignatian apostolic community responsible for school raises the question of the role of the Jesuits and the Jesuit community. Some pointed out that the presence of collaborators has provoked real questions of Jesuit identity for some Jesuits. Why be a Jesuit where collaborators can essentially do everything we can do? At the same time, if Jesuit communities are no longer the power in the school, what is the role of the Jesuit community? Can the Jesuit community still continue to think of the school as our school, over which we Jesuits expect to have some control or say? Can we expect that particularly if the Jesuit community is composed of a significant number of senior members who may be retirees or have no direct dealings with the school? So two related responses emerged to these questions. First, Father General pointed out in his dissertation that precisely the positive experience of collaboration underlines the need for Jesuits who will, in his words, be in a special way custodians of the spirit of Ignatius and the society. Secondly, this whole discussion of community as mission. If for Jesuits, the way we live community is mission, if our life together becomes a witness to the power of the gospel to overcome all the forces that divide people in the world, like caste, race, or tribe, then clearly the community retains a role. So what emerged from the discussions is that the role of Jesuit communities in our schools is no longer one of power and control, primarily, but one of accompaniment and witness. So this gives rise to a sixth set of questions that we might reflect on. How should we understand the role that the Jesuit community plays in our schools? How do Jesuit communities, the Jesuit communities you work with, we work with, understand our mission within the larger mission of the broader Ignatian apostolic community? And what needs to be done to change mindsets and attitudes? Seventh point. So we talked about apostolic instruments, the service of faith, bridging the church, and so on. I'm not going to give you a quiz, so that's all right. The promotion of justice has been a strong point of the society in recent years. This was affirmed by Father General. He pointed out that among the lights of the society today, among the positive developments of the society today, is the fact that the service of the poor informs all Jesuit ministries, whether social, educational, pastoral, or spiritual. He particularly commended outstanding initiatives in education for the poor in South Asia, Latin America, and the United States. Paradoxically, however, in his discovery, Father General also lamented the fact that while the social dimension of our mission has grown in acceptance and practice, at the same time, communities of Jesuits living with and like the poor have decreased in number. Father General expressed concern that direct contact and friendship with the poor seems to have declined, and he encouraged the renewal of shared life with the poor. Furthermore, during the congregation, some pointed out that in recent times, there seems to be a decline in the sense of and a concern for the structural causes of poverty. 
While direct assistance of the poor is valuable and needed, some felt the need for renewed attention to structures and structural change. A third concern was raised. Others brought up the importance of developing a deeper sense of intergenerational justice, particularly in view of the environmental concerns of the world. Our obligation to care for the ravaged environment, not just for ourselves, not just with the poor or our most deeply affected by the effects of environmental devastation, but for the sake of future generations. So this leads to a seventh set of questions. I wonder if Father General's comments about Jesuit communities might apply in some way to our schools. As we have grown in our commitment to forming men and women for our serving the poor, have we at the same time grown farther from the poor? It's a real question. Um, later, I, I know that brochures have been passed out among you of a new school, a new project we have in East Timor. And in the discernment, it's been very difficult, and we've had to check ourselves. We want to start a school for the poor in a country that is very poor. But there is this draw, seeing all the other Jesuit schools. And so someone, a scholastic, during the discernment mentioned, we want a school to be a prestigious school, like the Ateneo de Manila, for example. So we do have competing images um, of our schools, and they can get in the way of our discernment. At the same time, how is friendship with the poor encouraged and promoted? How have we help our students understand the structural roots of poverty and the present ecological crisis? And how have we created a passion to work for the transformation? Number eight. You still with me? In his discussion, Father General recalled that one of the great contributions of GC35 was its, was its emphasis on a perspective of greater universality. As Father General pointed out from the reports of the procurators and from his own observations, there seems to be in the past few years a happy rediscovery in the society of this dimension of universal mission. This sense that we Jesuits do not belong to a province but to the whole society. Paul General pointed out that among the young, there is an increased willingness to be sent for a mission anywhere in the world where there is need. This mindset, this universal mindset, has taken a concrete form in the reality of apostolic networks. So universality and networks are related. One is the spirit, one is a concrete realization. <laughs> Father General noted several times that the growth of these networks has been a positive recent development in the society. The walls between provinces, which used to be so high, are becoming increasingly porous. There is greater cooperation between provinces and between conferences, greater sharing of resources. The sharp, even competitive distinctions between ministry sectors are also dissolving as networks all over the world bring different ministries together in apostolic platforms. Yesterday, Jerry Bonschick mentioned the Plataforma Apostolica, uh, this, uh, this development in Spain and Latin America. Father General gave an example of how responding to ecological concerns or to migrants, for example, has brought together social centers, schools, parishes, spirituality centers, all working together for mission. So all of this is a very positive development. Interestingly, during the discussions about networks, one point that was raised was how little, though, how little we from Asia, Africa, and Latin America know about each other. We know far more about Europe and the United States due to our colonial histories. So during the congregation, several argued also quite convincingly that there is a need to privilege and to strengthen South-South networking and cooperation. 
An eighth point, then, for reflection. To what extent is there a sense of universal mission in our schools? Most of our schools are part of networks or educational associations within our provinces or even conferences. But how much sharing of perspectives, capacities, and resources goes beyond our country and continental borders? How much cooperation goes on between schools and other ministries? What can be done to promote South-South networks in society? I believe this afternoon there is going to be a workshop on the Gonzaga Network in Australia that does precisely ministry between, uh, the cross-sectoral ministry between the schools and the social ministries. Ninth point. Nice picture of Dr. General. In 2014, the Society is celebrating the 200th anniversary of the Restoration of the Society. And in his letter, convoking the Congregation of Procurators, Father General said that he wanted to use the moment of the Congregation of Procurators as a way of preparing for this commemoration of new life of the Society. Thus, he asked the Congregators, uh, the Procurators, to reflect on creativity in the, society, in the society. Father General himself addressed the theme of creativity in his final discourse as he looked to the future. And I found it very moving. And Father General, the deepest reason why we, are, we are, why we are called to ceaseless creativity is precisely because we have an alternative vision given to us by Jesus that of the kingdom of God. Everything in the world can be different if we see the world against the horizon of the kingdom. Christians are supposed to be people of the kingdom who are creative precisely because they are not satisfied with anything in the present state of affairs that is not part of God's vision. And Father General pointed out that Ignatius' emphasis on the matches, properly understood, also leads to creativity, because it is a refusable, refusal to be bound by anything that limits the coming of the kingdom of God in our world. I thought that perhaps the most insightful point in this discourse was the way Father General contrasted creativity and competition. All too often, magis is understood as competition. Excellence is understood as being better than others. But Father General pointed out that this is a misapprehension. Because competition, competing with others, means that we do the same thing as everyone else does, only better. This is not yet the creativity of the kingdom. Because this kind of competition is bound by the rules of the existing game. The creativity of the kingdom goes beyond these rules and looks beyond these rules. And so we might ask ourselves, to what extent are our schools inspired by competition? To what extent are we limited by our aspiration to be as good or better than some other schools? To what extent are we moved by the, creativity, by the creativity of the kingdom to transcend the expectations of others and to initiate the vision of Jesus for a new heaven and a new earth? How is the creativity of the kingdom promoted in our institutions? Number 10. I'm as relieved as you. <laughs> One of the somewhat unexpected emphases in Father General's Estatu report was that Jesuits are overworked and overextended. As he pointed out, Jesuit overwork and overextension was a recurrent theme in almost all the reports of the procurators. From all over the world, we heard the same thing. The Jesuits are overworked and overextended. 
And the problem is that overworked Jesuits cannot respond with depth and creativity to the new challenges of the world and the church. We're too busy focused on the present. We're too busy focused on maintaining what is. What is responsible for this state of affairs? Several times in this discussion, and many times throughout the discussions, the main problem identified is a refusal of Jesuits to be realistic about the number of institutions and apostolic works for which they can be responsible. We have too many institutions. And Father General underlined that this is essentially a problem of poor discernment. Jesuits know how to begin works, but we get too attached to them. We don't know how or when to entrust them into the hands of others who can keep them thriving better than we can. Thus, both in his estatu and in his final allocution, Father General insisted that one of the main challenges facing the society today is discerning about the future of our institutions perhaps more precisely, discerning about the society's commitment to all its present institutions. This is surely a point that touches many of us here, because the schools comprise the major institutional commitment of the Society of Jesus. One discernment that will probably have to be made in the near future will be to decide following a distinction made by GC35, which institutions might best be described as a nation, that is, sharing the spirit of the exercises and the spirituality of Ignatius, and which institutions will remain Jesuit, that is, not only sharing the Ignatian heritage, but also involving some form of Jesuit institutional responsibility. I imagine that more schools, more diverse schools, that are at present best described as Jesuit, will, or perhaps should probably become, described as Ignatian in the near future. Such a move, of course, might be interpreted negatively as abandonment by the society. However, I think it can be interpreted much more positively as a sign of trust and respect for our collaborators. Jesuits typically begin parishes and then hand them over to the diocesan clergy when it is felt that parishes are sufficiently strong and stable. Shouldn't we think of schools in a similar way? This might allow us to begin new initiatives. I, rec I, I remind you of Hachi's very important question yesterday. So this gathering might be a question, might be a good time to begin reflecting. What is the quality of our discernment about the future of our schools? How do we begin to have the freedom to discern whether we should think of ourselves more as a nation rather than just works? What kind of structures and programs do we need to maintain, to, to maintain a helpful connection to the heritage and vision of the Society of Jesus and what do we need to do to convince Jesuits, students, parents, and other interested publics that the vision and values of St. Ignatius so infuse a school that we don't need to worry about the future directions that the institution might take? That's it. <laughs> Please allow me a final point. Here I end my report from Nairobi, but I just want to end with a final brief recollection. 
While we were in Nairobi, I had a chance to speak with a scholastic from the Eastern African province who was heading for Regency in one of the high schools of the province, the one in Uganda, I believe. When I asked him how many schools the province was running, he answered four, one in Uganda, one in South Sudan, and two in Tanzania. He added that they were all new schools, three or four years old, except one school in Tanzania, which, in his own words, he said, oh, this school is very old. So I asked him when this very old high school was founded, and he said, in all innocence, 1994. <laughs> <laughs> it's all relative. But I want to end to highlight one last point. A, real, a reality that we experience very much in my part of the world, Asia-Pacific, as they also do in Africa. In Asia-Pacific, we have places with strong and established high schools, very old high schools, were certainly founded before 1994. In Australia, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Japan, Macau, the Philippines, Taiwan. And yet we also have places where the Jesuit educational apostle does not mean tweaking stable institutions or refining already well-developed programs, but actually beginning new schools in places where due to poverty, repression, and violence, quality education remains a basic need. And a Jesuit school can make a very significant contribution to the country. In places like East Timor, Cambodia, Myanmar, Eastern Malaysia, the north of Thailand and the tribal areas, Micronesia, Vietnam. We are starting, planning, or dreaming of new schools. We are daunted by great challenges, including our lack of resources. But we also have great hope. I say all this to underline that the Apostle of Jesuit education remains an important way of going to the frontiers, going to those places where, as Pope Benedict, where, as Pope Benedict told the 35th General Congregation, others do not reach but find it difficult to reach. That we should still be starting schools, new schools, means that the society continues to believe that through this ministry of education, we can still make a difference in the lives and the futures of peoples and the world. That through schools, Jesuit schools, one can still bring a bit of the light and hope and life of the kingdom of God to this dark world. I hope that our reflections on Jesuit identity, the Jesuit identity of our institutions, whether old or new, allow us to make of our schools more effective, more evangelical, more transformative apostolic instruments. May St. Ignatius help us live his spirit more authentically, more generously, more joyfully, so that we might contribute to the redemption and healing of God's children and all creation for the greater glory of God.